This is Live Well Talk on New Baby Well Visits. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unity Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital. As a parent of a new baby, you may feel overwhelmed, especially by all the visits you make in the first few months and years of your new baby's life. Today, we are talking about the importance of our relationships with baby's provider, what exactly all of those milestone appointments are, and additional appointments you may wish to see your child's provider about. Dr. Dinah Conte joins us to delve into what new parents should watch for, the importance of well checks, and more. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for you know, having me. As my children are older now, but uh, I could never keep straight when they had to go for what vaccinations. And I still <laughs> get that question uh, from friends and family that, uh, well, we're taken in for this 18 month visit. W- what vaccinations will they get? And I was like, I have no idea. You know, it's so complicated. <laughs> so take us through the importance of well child visits. Sure. Because, because this is true, even for parents with kids, there's nothing wrong with my kid. Why do I need to go in? Exactly. You know, adults do that later in life. I didn't go to the doctor because I feel well. Mm-hmm. Um, and understandable. You know, you don't take your car in to be worked on when it's running fine. Exactly. But there are maintenance and other things for your car. And I'm not treating children like cars because they're much more expensive than children. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, but uh, take us through as a new parent. Your counsel me on what to do for my child. Take it from there. Okay. Well, first, let me tell you that I am guilty of not having taken my daughter to the doctor for a well check one year. We completely skipped her eight-year well check. We just forgot. <laughs> So we're human too. <laughs> it, it's, it's confusing. So for babies, when they're first born, they are pretty complicated little human beings. They're very different from us as adults and different from us in a very unique set of ways. We as newborns are so fresh and new. We've never eaten. We've never pooped. <laughs> We've never swallowed air before. We've never taken a breath of air before. And so it's a pretty special time when you're born to have a a qualified professional to check your baby. And that's what we do as physicians, as pediatricians, as we, we look over your baby and make sure everything is working right. Make sure everything is working well. You see your baby pretty often. So I'm aware (laughs) that we, uh, attending the maternal fetal medicine conferences, I'm aware that there's some screening done prior uh, to delivery uh, on the mom. But tell me what happens at birth, after birth, you arrive, what what do we screen for? Sure. And I know some of that's regulatory state by state. It is. Here in the state of Iowa, that might be different than someplace else, but Correct. tell us about that. Correct. So there is a lab test that we do routinely for babies called a newborn screening test. Uh, a long time ago, it was called the PKU or the phenylketonuria test because that was what it was originally designed to detect was a condition called PKU. But we actually screen for 30 different conditions congenital and uh, familial conditions with just a few drops of blood. We collect that test when your baby is at least 24 hours old and ideally between 24 and 48 hours of life. And the reason for that is in those first few hours, the chemistry of your baby's blood is changing and there's still a lot of hormones and regulatory factors that are in the baby's blood from simply having been in the womb. So we we check them after they've been out of the womb for, for a good period of time. The the different things we check for are things like the PKU, but also cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, something called congenital hypothyroidism, tyrosinemia, things nobody's ever heard of except for pediatricians and scientists and other physicians who take care of babies. But that's a lot of different medical conditions that if we find them early in that first week or two of life, we can really make a big difference in how that child grows and develops over time. Oftentimes these conditions that we're checking for are fatal or disabling and we can really make a big impact if we find those early and that's what the newborn screening test does. Yeah that PKU uh, you know I've often the, the warning on the soda can. <laughs> yes. You know I'm always like gosh I hope someone knows they have this prior to cracking open this uh, can of soda. Yep. Um, new parents do I have to have a pediatrician uh, prior to birth, can I do it afterwards? Uh, oh, I mean, you don't I mean, have you, to have one. Yeah, you, you always dig the well before you're thirsty. So I would encourage everyone <laughs> to make that arrangement prior to delivery. But take me through that. Uh, yeah. I had my baby. I'm in the hospital. What do I ask for? Right. The reality is that the pregnancy goes by really quickly. 
<laughs> it feels like it drags on forever and then we've run out of time by the time the baby is born. So we do see families before uh, before delivery that are interviewing their pediatrician. So we have several at our office and our satellite offices. We have physicians and nurse practitioners in our practices and some will meet with a family ahead of time as kind of what I call a meet and greet. So <laughs> this is a family who needs a pediatrician. They want to ask questions about what's going to happen in the hospital and any kind of testing. And they kind of just want to get to know the pediatrician before they make a commitment to see one. And I think that's excellent. We always want to have a physician or provider who is connected with us in some way. We want to feel like we're going to someone we like and we trust. For those families who have not picked one, which is the vast majority, <laughs> the most common way that a family picks a pediatrician is a friend. So a friend says, oh, I see Dr. Conti or I see so-and-so and you should go too. And so that's commonly how a family will pick a pediatrician. But there's still a good number who've never met any of the pediatricians at the office or family practitioners in the area. And they say, you know, I, I, I need to find a doctor for my baby. How do I go about sure. doing this? So at St. Luke's, we have a, a picture list of the different physicians and providers in the area who are accepting newborn patients. And so that way, a family can look at the area they want to go to. They can look at the faces and see if this is someone, you know, sometimes our faces are the, I mean, that's the first thing people see and what people connect with. And so it's nice to have a picture list instead of just a list of names. names. So so we help facilitate that when when they're in the hospital. So the care established the the new well the well baby visits as we go. What 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 are what are the dates for those? Sure. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies make a connection and families make a connection with their pediatrician in the first few days after leaving the hospital. So we see babies in our office or recommend that they see their pediatrician in whichever office they choose to go to in that first two to three days after leaving the hospital. Now, for some babies, they're going to see their pediatrician in a week, and that's okay too. It depends on what their schedules are like and what their pediatrician or their provider recommends. But generally, we see babies in that two to three days after they leave. We're checking to make sure that the baby is eating well, the baby is peeing and pooping well. As I mentioned earlier, you know, they've never pooped before, they've never eaten before, so we want to make sure this is actually working and uh, and we want to make sure that we're talking with the family you know for a lot of families if this is their first baby or their fifth this is brand new even if you've had several kids before the current baby is brand new even if you find yourself being very experienced at parenting usually that new baby is going to challenge you in a way one of your others didn't and, it, and it, it's true uh, as an adult doctor but just confirm this that it's not unusual for the baby to lose a little weight at that Absolutely. first visit Absolutely. You know, I think par parents sometimes panic. They do. Most babies are going to lose weight those first few days of life. They were in a bag of water. Right. And so they were extremely well hydrated in the womb. And then once they come out here, it's dry. They have to support themselves orally. They have to get their fluids by their mouths. And then they're going to pee and poop. So they're losing fluid that in the in the womb, they, they weren't losing. So it was a closed system in there. Yeah. And so, uh, so yes, most of them will lose weight those first few days. And some a little more than others. We expect breastfed babies to lose a little bit more than mm. a formula fed baby. And really that's... Just because of the mechanics of yes, breastfeeding. Yes, absolutely. Because it is a little bit more of a struggle. So yeah, some babies yeah. are going to lose a little more fluid just in the process of nursing. But also because in those first few days, moms produce something called colostrum, which is very low in volume. It's high in nutrient. It's very important nutritional value, but it doesn't have a lot of fluid. Whereas formula is consistent. Every bottle has the same nutritional value, has the same amount of fluid. And so they're getting what would essentially be equivalent to, to mature breast milk in that first day of life when a breastfed baby would not be getting mature breast milk in the first day of life. So there's going to be some weight loss difference between the breastfed and the formula fed babies. Now, I know there's... I'm there's an advantage to breastfeeding, I'm sure. Um, Absolutely. But uh, nobody's sitting at a high school graduation going, well, that kid breastfed. No, that one didn't. <laughs> You're, uh, absolutely is, you, right. you know, so, You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, yes. So maybe you could give some reassurance that... Uh, there, there are certainly advantages, but it, you're not uh, putting your child at disadvantage if exactly. they're not breastfed. Exactly. Yep. There, there's not a medal for, <laughs> for 
for there, the moms who nurse. There for, should be. Yeah, there should be. That stuff is liquid gold. <laughs> it is so valuable. But the truth is that that is not uh, the only source of nutrition for some babies. And for some babies, they never get a drop of breast milk, and they do fantastic. So, like you said, you're not sitting around as an adult going, mm, which one were you? Um, as an infant, I want a parent to feed their baby. It doesn't matter to me if they choose breast milk or formula as long as they're feeding their baby. Or the ones who choose breast milk, fantastic. And the ones who choose formula, that's fantastic too. If they do a little bit of both, even better. <laughs> Babies who are breastfed are getting a little bit of a, almost like a vaccine every time they breastfeed. Sure, they are getting yeah. some antibodies and some other useful hormones from their moms. So there are definitely those benefits. But the truth is that if a mom is not bonding with her baby by nursing, I would rather her choose a nutritional source that lets her bond. I would rather her feel comfortable when she's holding her baby and loving her baby rather than feeling so overwhelmed by whether I'm feeding them properly and feeling like there's so much stress to exclusively nurse that they're not enjoying that time. I would that's rather that's them enjoy it. Great advice. As a new parent, it's this is all new to me and I have my child. When should I call the pediatrician? We recommend that you call us in the first day or so after your baby is born to set up that follow-up appointment I mentioned. And you can call your pediatrician anytime. At our office, we have our nurses and our physicians and nurse practitioners are available Sunday through Saturday. We are available seven days a week, except for major holidays, but uh, but you can call any time. And if it's not during office hours, you can call the same number, whether you call the Hiawatha Clinic or you call the Westdale or you call the downtown clinic where I am. If you call after hours, you get one of our nurses. You get a nurse who is paid by St. Luke's who is going to give you advice that we have approved ahead of time. We're pretty pretty particular about sure. how we treat our families, how we and, treat our patients. And I imagine it's as an adult physician, you know, I tell patients and family members, call me 1,000 times and have <laughs> me tell you nothing to worry about. Absolutely. As opposed to the time you delay, particularly for adults, I'm sure it's the same for children uh, and infants. Time is of the essence in some medical conditions. Absolutely. You know, you have uh, the, the window of opportunity to treat and Nothing uh, disappoints me more than someone that had trepidation about calling me. Absolutely. Uh, so is that the, that's the same for children? Agree. Absolutely. No such Dr. thing as a dumb question. They, no, they, they absolutely. And I tell families that I would rather see you for something simple several times than have you struggle with something potentially very serious at home without the help. Even if families call in the middle of the night, if they want to speak with a physician, they're going to get one of the pediatricians from our office, from one of our three locations, every single time. They're going to get somebody who knows who their pediatrician is, knows a little bit about how their pediatrician practices, but more importantly is holding themselves and our team to the highest standards. So if a family says, well, I think this might be silly, but I really want to know the answer now, then just call. Sure. It's great advice. What are some of the most common questions you receive? Newborn rashes are varied and hard to sort out as a parent. There's baby acne. There's cradle cap. There's dry skin. There's, there's diaper rash. Oh my goodness, there's so many different types of diaper rash. And so newborn rashes are typically something that we'll get a call about or that we'll see a baby for. A blocked tear duct is a common one too in newborns where the tear ducts that drain tears away from the eyes are not very well developed. And so tears will build up on the eye. A lot of times parents think that their two-week-old has pink eye, but they don't. They just have a blocked tear duct. And that requires us to take a look to see the baby's face, to look at the eyes and potentially the ears or the nose to, to sort out what it is. So that's a common one too. Feeding problems are very common also. I mean, as parents, our instinct is to feed our children. What do I do if my kid won't eat what I've prepared? That one's a big question that comes up all the time, not just for infants, but for older children too. I prepare this food and my kid only wants chicken nuggets and fries. What am I going to do? And those parents are afraid to make changes because they don't want their children to, to go hungry, rightfully so. Uh, so that's a common one we get questions about too. Ear infections and strep throat, no, no season. They are year-round. So true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we get those a lot too. <laughs> what about 
Well, you know, you, I, I'm glad you mentioned rashes because as an adult physician, I always tell the, the residents and the medical students and fellow physicians, fever and a rash is something that needs to be assessed Absolutely. You know, yep. whether it's not, we can find the continuum of care, the spectrum, you know, whether it's uh, meningitis mm-hmm. or parvovirus or something really benign. Right. But it is definitely something that should should be assessed. Absolutely. And because I overhear this sometimes with other physicians when they're talking to family practitioners, pediatricians. How many diapers should a, a child have in an hour, a baby? Oh, gosh. In a, in a day. Because <laughs> they'll say, day. They'll, I'll hear them say, well, they've only had one diaper. Uh, right. Wet. And like, right. that means something. And I'm always sitting there going, eh, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. A well-fed infant is probably going to have between 6 and 15 wet diapers okay. in a 24-hour period. So less than 6, you <laughs> kind of yeah, start we want to know. Okay. We want to know about it. If your baby has gone six to eight hours with no pee, just give us a call. Okay. Now, a normal, healthy newborn may go a whole week without having a bowel movement, and that's okay. It's more about the the urine, but we want to hear about that, too. If you're worried your baby hasn't had a bowel movement in a few days, give us a call. We're happy to walk you through it. Again, no such thing as a dumb question. Absolutely not. Well, let me wrap up today, uh, and thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, today. This has been very informative, for, particularly for myself. I'm happy to. Uh, yeah. ho- hopefully grandchildren are a ways off for me, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I'll be prepared when they do arrive. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time because I know how busy your practice is. Again, this was Dr. Dinah Conti, a pediatrician from Unipoint Clinic Pediatrics. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers, about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.